All right, come on up. Come right here. See if I can find any gold for you guys. You guys like gold coins? There's a gold coin. Oh, we got another. You want a gold coin? Can I put it in your pocket? You want to put it in your pocket? I mean, it's cool having a pocket. Hey, kiddos, I want to show you something that I, that I have. I, I brought a different box today, and you're sitting on it. Can you stand up just for a second and look in the box? Stand up just for a second. Let's look in the box. Oh, look. Look at these things. I've, can you hold those for me? Now, I have some good news and bad news today, all right? The, the bad news is you kids are good kids, and I know that, but you're going to do some, some things that are not good. And every, every time you do something bad, it's kind of like this little piece of red. Oh, that was bad. So I want you to take, I want you to take as many of these as, as you think you'll do bad things in your life. Do you need just one or need a whole bunch? A whole handful. Do you, need, do you need one or a whole bunch? Do you need any? Probably not. Yeah, I mean, you're like a perfect little rap. Do you need any? A whole bunch. Yeah, well, see, I need more than our in here. And so come back here with me over here. Over here. Come over here. Oh, see, you're already dropping stuff. Look, and as we go along, we go, oh, I did a bad thing. I said something unkind, and we throw that on the ground, right? I did a bad Have you ever done a bad thing? You want to admit it right now? Oh, not specifically. Okay, but if you did a bad thing, throw it on the ground. Did you ever do a bad thing? You ever do a bad thing? Throw it on the ground. I know you didn't do a bad thing. Did you? Are you going to throw that whole wad down there? And then you go along, and, and you're a little unkind. You're a little not nice to your sister. Or you say something bad to your parents. Or you tell a little, little white lie. Hey, how come I'm the only one dropping bad things on the ground? Because <laughs> you guys know. All right, you got it? Do you, will you drop this on the ground for me? Will you drop it? There, good. All right. You come in with, just keep throwing them on the ground. See, this is bad news. Look at all this stuff that we've messed up. Boy, you're having a bad day over there. There's a whole pile of bad stuff, right? And you get to be my age and you're way out here because you guys are at the beginning of life. You're still doing bad things. They're everywhere. That's really bad. But you know what? The, the beauty of it is that Jesus forgives us of our bad things. So the red things are bad things because the Bible says, though your sins were as scarlet, red, they will be white as snow. So Jesus comes in and Jesus says, I'm going to forgive you of the bad things you do. So we're going to let this white rope remind us of how many of our sins God forgives. All right, will you do me a favor? Will you come over here and hold this rope right here? But I want you to hold it with your foot. Will you turn around this way, just like that? All right. I'm going to put that under your foot. Stand on it real tight. Don't let it pull. Like if I try to pull it, don't let it pull. And you, young lady, are going to show how many of the sins Jesus forgives. As many as it, I mean, you can do anything inside the circle of sin, all right? But should I put it out here so it includes these? Yeah, all right, good. Oh, I better hold it out here, all right? And you just put a big circle to cover all the sins that, it, that, that Jesus' death on the cross forgives. Oh, all the way out to there? It, is it stuck? Oh, no. Oh, no. Here, let's see what's going on. Well, here, here's what you do. <laughs> okay. okay, now you good? Yeah. Okay, now you got, you got plenty of Now you got plenty. Because we got lots of sins. Uh-oh, I messed. Oh, we messed up down here. Come back here. Come here, you got to stand on that. All right? Stand on it real tight. Nice shoes, by the way. All right. How'd we do? Pretty good. Are you satisfied with that? Are you satisfied with that? There's only one problem with thank you. There's only, what about all of his sins over there? They're not forgiven? Oh, they are forgiven. Well, that's pretty good. Except for, keep pulling. Oh, see that one? Oh, good. Oh, no, look over here. We're messing up over here because I stepped off of it over here. Look. The beauty of what Jesus has done for us on the cross is he doesn't just say, well, I'll forgive all the ones that are in the middle. Or I'll forgive some of your sins while you're young. No, no, no. Jesus goes, you know what? My forgiveness goes all the way and forgives all of your sins from the first one to the last one and all of them in between. That's what Jesus does. That's what we're celebrating today. Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. He comes back in the resurrection, and we are forgiven for 
all of our sins. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? All right, can you guys huddle up at the box? Can you guys huddle up over here? Come over here. Come over here. All right? And I'm going to pray for us and thank Jesus for his forgiveness. Jesus, I thank you that when you died on the cross for my sins and for the sins of this congregation and for the sins of humanity, you didn't just cover some of them or some of them that weren't so bad, you covered all of our sins with forgiveness. I thank you for that. That doesn't make us want to sin more because you are powerful. It makes us just overwhelmed by what you did for us. Thank you for loving us and for dying on the cross for our sins and for coming back in the resurrection. Amen. Hey, will you guys help me put all that stuff back? I don't know if you guys um, uh, saw this, this tiny little one-paragraph uh, article on WHIO's uh, website a week ago Tuesday. I'm actually going to read it word for word so I don't get it wrong. Um, a man cleaning his brother's new home in West Milton found a World War II-era 75-millimeter tank shell Monday afternoon. The unidentified man was in the attic at the home located in the 7500 block of North Montgomery County Line Road, when he noticed the ordinance, said Sergeant Chris Bob of the Miami County Sheriff's Office. The sergeant said officials don't know how long the shell had been in the home, but the year 1945 was stamped on it. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and Dayton Bomb Squads were called to the scene. They removed the shell from the attic and detonated it in a field about 8.30 p.m. No other ordinance was found in the home. There were no injuries. The media. They don't get the facts of the story right most of the time, and this time is one of those. First of all, it said it was in a new home. It wasn't in a new home. It was in a one-room schoolhouse that was converted to a house in the 50s and has been absent for about two and a half years. Um, secondly, uh, the article said the unidentified man found the unexploded ordinance on Sunday afternoon, uh, on Monday afternoon. Actually, it was found on Sunday afternoon. And it wasn't in the attic of the house, it was in the attic of the garage of the house. Um, thirdly, the article said that the bomb squad removed the shell from the attic. Also not true. Um, they removed it from the garage floor where the unidentified man had put it when he found it in the attic and carried it down and inspected it and thought it was really cool and showed it to his wife who immediately told him to put it down and that's when I did put it down. <laughs> And then the unidentified man went to his house and got his iPad and came back and took pictures of it, then went home and tried to look it up on the internet, then sent it to all of his close friends and said, look what I found in my brother's house. And, and uh, yeah, there were a lot of errors in that story. The reality is I took the pictures the next day. You need the full story. So my brother bought the house next to me five years ago, six years ago, lived in it for two and a half, then moved back to Boston. The house sits empty, and he decided he's going to sell the house. And he asked me if I would clean out the garage and the attic. The former owner before my brother never cleaned out the garage and the attic, and so there's all kinds of stuff. And I was there to find out what was trash, what was scrappable, because I like getting money for trash, and what was potential treasure. And so I was sorting through things, and I came on this box right here. Now, you can't see it unless you're in the front row. And on the top, I didn't notice it because it was open, but on the top it says very plainly, USAF bomb sling type A7. And inside this box were all these what looked like cylinder heads to a biplane engine, you know? And I thought, well, gosh, what are those things? And then, and I had to make up a dummy because the old one really was exploded. I found something that was about this size, and it was made out of aluminum foil, but it did have a, a solid aluminum head right here, which is where the fuse was. And right here, it had this little screw. And the screw had, it could either be on some setting I didn't know, SF, I think it was, or it could be on delay, and I didn't know what that meant. And I came downstairs and I said, Linda, look at this thing. And she immediately said, put that down. That looks like an unexploded bomb. And I said, oh, it's clearly not a bomb. I mean, number one, I'm going to say something offensive now, warning. She's a girl. What does she know? 
about World War II 75 millimeter unexploded ordnance. And secondly, I grew up as a boy playing Vietnam War, so I know quite a bit about this stuff. And this bomb couldn't be a bomb because it didn't have any tail fins, you know? It would just go anywhere. No, it was a 1945 75 millimeter unexploded ordnance that would be fired from a tank. Doesn't have to have tail fins. And when the bomb squad got there, they x-rayed it, and then they told me and my wife to go back to our house and not come out because they suspected it was not a fragment bomb with shrapnel in it, but had a chemical component to burn our skin off, and they told me to go home. Now, I don't know if you're as stupid as I am, <laughs> but if you found something like this in your brother's attic, would you do like I did? Would you walk around and go, this is so cool? Would you take pictures of it? Would you look at the label and try to look up the name of the company? Would you e email that to all your friends and think it was really cool? Or were, would you be smarter like my wife who said, put it down? So I did. I put it down on the garage floor like this. She goes, don't put it down like that. If it falls over, it could explode. So I put it down like this. And she goes, you might not want to put it there. Look what's next to it. Two 10-gallon cans of kerosene. She said, you might want to put it over there. So I grabbed it and I walked over and I put it down. You probably have never found an ordinance in your brother's attic. But I bet if you did, half of you would be just like me. You'd think it was neat. It didn't occur to me until the next day when the Wright Pat Bomb Squad came and they told us the chemical component part. It didn't occur to me how dangerous it was that I was carrying this thing around that's been sitting over at my brother's house for all 16 years that I've lived right next door. It didn't occur to me how dangerous it was and how stupid I was until the bomb squad blew it up. They got permission from Mr. Stebbins, the owner of the farm to the north and west of us, to blow it up on his property, and they told us we had to stay at our property. I said, I can't watch, I can't take absolutely no pictures of this. And so I stood on my deck, and from 500 yards away, uh, we couldn't even see them. But we heard the explosion, we saw a plume of smoke go way up, and we felt it in our chest. And it was at that point that I really went up from 500 yards away, I felt it in my chest, that it dawned on me how stupid I was, and how so many humans are just like me, because the reality is this. I was drawn to something that had the capacity to utterly destroy me. And I think that's kind of a commentary on humanity. We are drawn to things, hopelessly drawn to things, that will utterly destroy us. Let me give you an illustration of that. Do you hear a B-52 above us? Yeah, me too. I guess they've got my number now at the bomb squad. Let me illustrate it this way. I don't know if you've ever found anything like this uh, in, in your attic, but I do believe that we as humans tend to be drawn to things that will destroy us. Let me illustrate it multiple ways, and maybe you can connect to any of these. Your mouth starts talking. Whether it's an anger moment or a gossip moment, your mouth stop, starts talking, and you tell your mouth, stop it. Stop it. You're saying to stop it. Stop it. Stop right now. You're saying to, you're getting real close to a line, and you can't get your mouth to stop until it all comes out, and then you regret it. Oh, speaking of the mouth, there's another scenario where we are drawn to our own destruction, like this one. You ever go to a Mexican restaurant? Their plates are the size of the platter for the whole table, and they fill it with a dish for you. And you know this going in, and you know it's going to be way too much food, and so you promise yourself going in, I'm going to cut it in half the minute they bring it. I'm saving this half for lunch tomorrow. But it tastes so good that what do you do? Okay, well, I don't need that much. I mean, lunch isn't a big meal. It's a lighter meal. So you eat the half and fully satisfy yourself, then you eat the half of the half that's for lunch tomorrow. And now it tastes so good, you go, well, what you that's not enough for lunch tomorrow. And you eat the rest of it. And then you regret it as you're walking out of the restaurant going, oh my gosh, I ate too much. I'm miserable. As you waddle to the car. 
we are drawn to our own destruction. How about this one? I don't know if you like to go to the mall, you like to go shopping, and, and you know you don't need any way, maybe you need one thing. So you go for that one thing, but you can't really buy a pair of shoes now and, and be satisfied with that because now you need something to go with the shoes. If you're a guy, you probably need a purse. If you're a guy, you probably need a pair of socks. And oh my goodness, those socks look so good that you have to have the pair of pants that goes with the socks. And all of a sudden, you've spent like $200 when you just went in for a pair of shoes and that's all you really needed and you, you know you shouldn't be doing it and you regret it and yet you are drawn to your own destruction. How about this one? Let's strike America at our core in personal economics. We can't afford it, but we have a credit card. And we know that the bill is going to bring some regret because the bill's going to come, let's see, it's March. The bill's going to come in April, and then it's going to come in May, and then it's going to come in June. It's going to keep coming because you spent so much money. And you know it going into it, and you continue to be drawn to things that are for your own destruction. It might not be a 75-millimeter World War II-era unexploded ordinance but we think it's neat. We are drawn to things that will destroy us. I sat at my desk the other day in my classroom, uh, heading up to Easter break. I had a big deadline for my students. It's a draft of their research paper. They don't have to be done. They just have to have a four-page draft with a work cited. Take the pressure off, then go on break, then come back and finish it. And one of my best students walked up to my desk, pretty serious, and she said, Mr. Kurtz, I need an extension uh, on the deadline. And I said to her, kiddo, what's up? Why do you need an extension? You're going to have to you know, present your case. And she said, things are pretty bad at my house right now. And I could tell she was pretty serious. And so I shifted from teacher to human. And I said, is there anything that I can do for the things that are bad at your house? And she said, no. My dad is just an idiot. And then she paused, then the tears started to flow, and she said, we caught my dad contacting other women. This is the second time we've caught him. And I don't know if, if their marriage is going to survive. Why do men do this? For the same reason they walk around with things that could destroy them and think it's neat. Because we as humans are hopelessly drawn to things that can destroy us. What does this have to do with Easter Sunday? Everything. Since the beginning of human history, humans have been tempted by and have lost the battle to temptation and sin. Since the beginning of human history. And so God sets up this great system. All right. When you do something wrong, you need to take from your possessions, your flock back in the day, and you need to take a dove or a, or a lamb or a goat or a bull, and you need to take it to the priest when you've sinned, and you need to have the priest go through a ceremony where he will shed the blood of an innocent animal to pay for the sins of a guilty human. And the priest would take that blood and spread it on the altar. You're forgiven. And then the people would walk out the door of the temple, and they would go and they'd commit more sin. And they would get another dove or a, a, a lamb or a goat or a bull, and they would bring it back to the priest, and he would slaughter that animal and sprinkle the blood of an innocent animal to cover the, the sins of a guilty human. And, and, and then the, the people would have their forgiveness in hand, and they would walk out the door of the temple, and the cycle just perpetually re repeats over and over and over again. And God eventually in human history says, okay. Enough of the animal sacrifice, I'm sending my son Jesus to be the Lamb of God, to pay for the sins of the world. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to take you not to one of the Gospels, so that would be obvious on Easter. I want to take you to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, uh, where it's summed up this sacrifice of Jesus and what Jesus does for us in his death and then in his resurrection, Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to start reading in, in verse 11 and just notice the comprehensive nature of the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. Look at verse 10, uh, chapter 10, Hebrews, verse 11. Day after day, 
Every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when this priest, talking about Jesus, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And, and where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Do you notice the comprehensive nature of the forgiveness of Jesus. Look at verse 12, really important verse here. But when this priest, when Jesus has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus, when he dies on the cross, we hear him utter the words, it is finished. No more doves, no more lambs, no more goats, no more bulls. It is finished. By this sacrifice of innocent Jesus, Son of God, it is finished. And what's he do? He sits down at the right hand of God the Father. It is finished. The forgiveness that Jesus bought for us on the cross, it is finished. Which means the sins you committed in high school, yeah, covered. The sins you committed in your 20s, taken care of. The sins in your early career years, Covered by the blood of Jesus. The sins of this year, last week, next week, into the future, all covered by the blood of Jesus. Jesus says, it is finished. And he sits down at, at the right hand of God. It's done. We have covered it. We have paid this debt. Done. Deal over. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just the forgiveness of sins. I mean, that, that's pretty powerful. But that's not the end of it. If you drop down to, to, to verse 17, it says this. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Oh, I don't know which is my favorite part, the forgiveness of my sins or the fact that God doesn't remember my sins. I do, but he doesn't. So when I say the sins when you were in high school, in your 20s, in your early career, in your 40s, last week, next week, once we ask Jesus to forgive, he doesn't even remember them anymore. In Psalm 103, verse 12, great verse, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Jesus doesn't just forgive our sins on the cross and sit down at the right hand of the Father. He blots them from his memory, and we don't have to worry about them coming in anymore. Oh, my goodness. More powerful than a World War II 75-millimeter tank shell that puts a concussion in your chest from 500 yards away when they blow it up is the power of forgiveness and the forgetfulness of God to the sins I've committed and will commit. That's pretty cool. But that's only half of it. The other half is tied up in verse 16. Look at what he says in verse 16. This is what God wants to do after he forgives and forgets. Verse 16, this is a covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. God wants to totally change our thinking about what we are attracted to. Me? Me? I see a case with an unexploded mortar that could kill me, that could destroy me, and I think it's neat, and I handle it, and I photograph it, and I brag about it to all my friends through email pictures. And what God wants me to say is, no, 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 that's the wrong thinking. What, what you need to think is, this is a destructive force that could ruin you. I, I should be running from this, not running to this. I should be getting rid of this, not handling it, and bragging about it. <laughs> my attitude should be a whole lot more like my wife's attitude to something that could destroy me than my attitude towards something that can destroy me. You know, it wasn't until I felt the concussion in my chest that I realized the destructive force that I was holding on to. 
And now Jesus says, this is the covenant. I want to change your thinking. I want you in your heart to, to understand that what I have in mind for you is something good. It's not just that I'm putting boundaries on your life. It's boundaries so that you don't blow yourself up. It's boundaries so that you don't destroy yourself. It's boundaries so that you don't have your 17-year-old daughter with tears running down her face asking for an extension on a homework assignment. That's how I want you to think towards sin. Look, after we come to, to terms with our destructive tendencies, after we stop rationalizing our sin and we realize, oh my goodness, that could destroy me, we have this moment of like epiphany. I desperately need a Savior because I am desperately drawn to things that can destroy me. Can I take you to, um, can I take you to the morning of the resurrection? So we just heard, um, the morning of the resurrection goes like this. So, so Jesus is dead and buried, and the disciples are in despair because they really believed in him, and they invested in him. He was the Messiah, and now he's dead. And, and so on the, the, the morning of resurrection, it's the ladies that go. They, they have spices. They're going to take care of the body of Jesus. And when they get to the tomb, they go in there, and it's like his body isn't here, and they're distraught, and they turn, and they say to a guy that they think is a gardener, if you'll ch show us where you put his body, we want to, and it's Jesus. And he confronts them with the resurrection, and angels speak to the ladies, and the message is, you go back and you tell the boys what's gone on. And they go back to the disciples, and they tell them. And if you read the gospel accounts, most of the disciples go, you guys are outside of your minds. You don't know what's going on. But two of them, John and Peter, say, you've got to be kidding, and they take off running to the tomb. Now, in the world of athletics, John is a better athlete. He outruns Peter. But the fact that Peter is running to the tomb of a resurrected Jesus just kind of blows me away here. Peter? Other than Judas, the next biggest failure in the final week of the life of Jesus is Peter, who swears his loyalty, and Jesus says, you personally will deny me three times in the next 12 hours, and Peter does. Peter should not be running to an empty tomb to have to be confronted by Jesus. Peter should be running to a cave to hide from the resurrected Jesus. And yet, Peter is running to the tomb. Why? Because Peter, more than any of the other disciples, knows that he needs a Savior. Can we be honest? It's church. Might as well be honest here. We are all drawn to things that destroy us. We're hopelessly drawn to it. We are drawn to it as we're expressing regret for being drawn to it. We all need a Savior. The beauty is the offer of Jesus is, yes, no more doves or, or lambs or goats or bulls. I am the Savior. And I took care of paying your whole sin debt. From your high school days all the way up to 10 years from now, I covered all of that sin debt. And I forget about those sins because I blotted out of my memory. But that's only half of the story. The other half is when you feel the concussion in your chest and you realize the destructive power of the things we are drawn to, when you have your epiphanal moment of that could have destroyed me, that's when Jesus wants to change your thinking and say, see, stay away from it. Run from it. So I had a fun day, non-eventful. And then I felt the concussion in my chest and had kind of a wake-up call. Have you ever had that con concussion in your chest? That moment where you say, I can't rationalize this behavior. I can't rationalize my desire for things that destroy me. I need a savior. And I need my thinking to be changed by the power of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. May God add his blessing to the reading and explanation of his word.